Has anyone ever tried to uh, burn a Christmas tree? Yeah. yeah. You, so you know how that is, right? They're very flammable. Um, we try to break, my wife and I, we try to break uh, stereotypes, you know, usually with the Hispanics. Or, and we're the guys that leave out the Christmas lights for till, you know, past summer. And, uh, <clears throat> but we stopped doing that. Anyway, but um, we still have the Christmas tree, so uh, we just had it in our backyard just taking up space. And we we're trying to get rid of it. I tried to put it on fire, and it was kind of nice. Started off with a little flame, and then it just pff, was all over. I had a, I had a uh, what is it, a shovel? So I was running around, you know, trying to put it out. And, you know, I broke a sweat. I was sweating bullets. I was under a lot of pressure because, you know, we are walled in, but I have a lot of neighbors, and if a house goes on fire, I'm in trouble. You know? I could just see the news, you know, pastor uh, has a, burns a house down, you know. We're supposed to be saving people from the fire, not, not causing them to be burned. But, yeah, you know. Uh, that tree put me under a lot of pressure for a moment, for a moment there. Today's message is titled uh, Under Pressure. Uh, John 18, uh, we begin with uh, just uh, the last hours of Jesus. He's uh, going to be afflicted from different angles, some internal pressure, some religious pressure, um, some pressure from Judas, of course. He was one of his disciples. He was close to him. He's a son of perdition. I'm pretty sure that hurt Jesus as well. Some pressure from the government. He was going to be judged by Pilate and Herod and uh, Caiaphas and Annas. Last week, or the week before last week when Gail was here, but uh, when I was here last, uh, we covered chapter 17, right? Remember the, the high chiefly prayer there, the priestly prayer, where uh, Jesus has this long prayer and he includes uh, you and, and me because he prays for those that would believe in the word of the disciples. And that's us, right? So the longest prayer, prayer and the spectrum of who it includes, right? Because it included us. And he ends with that. He prays for his disciples because he's about to leave. And you guys remember he told them, you know, where I go, you can't go. Not at this time anyway. So it's interesting because we start off at, at the garden, right? The garden of Gethsemane. It doesn't name it this way here, but the other gospels uh, point to the same garden, right? They're parallel. The synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's interesting because you know, the whole sin problem started in the garden as well, right? Garden of Eden. And now Jesus is going to finish it, and, well, he's going to start off in a garden because that's where he's going to allow himself to be taken over by uh, the, the law there, the Jewish law. So it's, it's very interesting. The first Adam started the problem. Uh, the last Adam here is going to finish it, Jesus Christ. I divided this message in through, in, into the three types of uh, pressures that Jesus has here. We're going to start with the internal pressure which is uh, what I titled uh, Jesus uh, Agonized. Let's start in verse 1 here of chapter 18. It says, When Jesus had spoken these words, and that's the, the prayer uh, found in the previous chapter, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron. At first glance, you might be thinking, well, what's, okay, the brook Kidron, let's move on. What's the big deal with that, right? But the brook Kidron has, there's some special uh, significance to it because of, uh, uh, during that time, there was a Passover, right? So, you know, you got a bunch of lambs that are being sacrificed, a lot of blood. There's, where's, do they have a sewer? Where is it going? Well, what they did was that they poured out the blood on, you know, the top of the hill there, and it went down through the brook of Kidron. So, here in verse, set, in verse 1, it says, He went out with his disciples over the brook, brook Kidron, okay? The sinless lamb, Jesus Christ, he's crossing over this brook and possibly, it's, you know, got blood on it, it's red. It's, he's, he's possibly being reminded of what he's going to suffer, how he's going to shed his own blood as a sinless lamb. Some typology there. Another interesting thing about this brook is that uh, the Old Testament king, David, remember that? He ran away from Absalom there. He was rejected by the people and he ran away from, from Absalom. He crossed this same brook. Here we see the, the, the king of kings, the lord of lords, he's being rejected by the world, and he's crossing over this same brook. Some more typology there, the Messiah. As you can see there, he was probably looking at just blood flowing there, and he's going into the garden here. The other gospels tell, tell us that he was under a lot of stress. Now, I, I have the word stress, and here's why. Look at what Matthew, Matthew's account tells us. Matthew 26, 38 says, he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. 
He told his disciples that. His soul is exceedingly sor sorrowful even to death. He's basically saying, look, I feel like I'm going to die here. That's, if that's not stress, I don't know what it is. He was under a lot of stress. Luke 22, the, the physician tells us, being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like drops of blood falling down to the ground. And like all doctors, he gives us a description of what's going on. Details. Describes the sweat looking uh, like blood. And there is a condition called hematridosis, which is actually when you're under a lot of pressure, a lot of stress, you will, it's, it's rare, but it does happen, you will sweat out some, some blood from your glands there. Very interesting here. The first Adam at the garden. And there's a lot of things that happen here. Uh, John doesn't focus on that. The other uh, disciples of the, what is it, Matthew, Mark, and Luke do focus on it. They, it tells us how Jesus went out to pray. He told these guys, hey, watch and pray. They go to sleep. He comes back and reminds them after about uh, intervals of an hour. And uh, he's there. The Bible says that angels come to comfort him. He's under a lot of stress there, knowing what he's going to, uh, to have to endure for all humanity, for you and me. A great reminder of what he did for us. It wasn't all just, you know, at the cross. He, he endured a, a lot of pain before it as well. Now let's move to verses 2 to 5. Here we see the actual betrayal. Judas is about to betray uh, his master. But we all know what, what was uh, Judas's master. You know, it was, he, he loved mammon. He loved money. Verse 2 says, And Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Again, Judas knew the fa favorite hangout place of Jesus and the disciples because he was with them all the time, right? The, the Garden of Gethsemane. And this garden actually stands, the, the actual word Gethsemane stands for, uh, what is it, uh, oil press or wine press. Again, where Jesus was pressed, right? Going back to the first point here, Jesus uh, being under a, lot, under a lot of internal pressure, a lot of stress. Levi Lusco was talking about a time when he went to, uh, to go visit the Garden of Gethsemane not so long ago. And, uh, he, was with, he was with other pastors. They're excited. They go to Jerusalem there. and uh, um, He's there, and it's closed. The garden is closed. They can't get in. It's dark already. And they're like, well, we've gone all this way. So they sort of jump over the, the fence there and break into the Garden of Gethsemane. And they started thinking, okay, we could get arrested. And uh, it's dark. And they're thinking about all the applications they could use for a sermon. But they got out of there before they were arrested. They didn't want to go through with it. That's kind of interesting. Notice in verse 3. <clears throat> then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. How ironic. Bringing light to the actual light of the world. He, he wasn't afraid. He actually stepped up to them with boldness, and, and you'll see in a minute. But here you see Jesus brings this detachment of troops, this uh, what we would call a SWAT team, a bunch of guys. Some have said it anywhere from 200 or 600 soldiers, and they're mixed of Roman soldiers and you know, officials there, Jewish officials and all that. A bunch of guys. You know, I was thinking in between services that when Jesus comes back again to judge the world, right, the second coming, right, not the rapture, but when he steps forward on here, Earth again, you know, the Battle of Megiddo, you know, you're going to see all troops, all weapons, tanks, imagine that, coming up against the Lord of Lords, and he's going to defeat, defeat him with his word. You know, this is going to happen again in the future, except with more, you know, the whole world united against him, all those that go up against the Lamb there. Look at verse 4. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? They answered him, Jesus of Na uh, they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. If uh, you might see some italics here in, in your Bible and, and the surrounding the word he, because it's not there on the original. He just said, I am. The, the Lord, ego Amy, which is basically God's name in the Old Testament, right? When he, when he tells uh, Abraham from the burning bush, you know, tell them I am uh, that I am has sent you. One of God's uh, uh, names there. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. So Judas was there. Jesus is here boldly, and he tells him, I am. And he's going to say this, this phrase three times. Look at verse 6, and in, into his actual arrest. It says, Now when he said to them, I am he, second time, they drew back and fell to the ground. 
You see that right there? Just there's just power in, in the name of the Lord. I mean, only I mean only He can do. That. I can say I am all I want, but I, I have no power. It's through Jesus Christ, and and He did that. They all fell back. You, you just see the glory of, of Jesus there. You know, just to let them know, hey, I'm giving myself over. You're not arresting me. I'm allowing myself to be taken. I wonder though, if Judas was left standing, or if he also fell back with the rest of the, of the two hundred plus men here. I wonder. I would think, my opinion, maybe Judas stayed up just to show that here, you're the one betraying me, don't hide behind these men. That would be my, my opinion. But <clears throat> Let's continue here. Verse 7, Then he asked them again, Whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am. I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way. See, it wasn't meant for them to follow after Jesus. He wanted them to, to be protected, to leave. It was Jesus that they were going to take. He wanted to protect his, his sheep, as we see here in verse 9. That the saying might be fulfilled, which he spoke of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. Look at verse 10 here. Peter. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it back, struck the high priest's servant, and cut off his right ear. And his name was Malchus. So we see Peter, right? He's usually the one that steps out and does something all the time. And I was telling the earlier service that, you know, you guys remember, uh, if you guys were here in chapter 12 or 13 when they're at the Last Supper, and Jesus says, someone here on the table is going to betray me. And then Peter's probably sitting on this side of the table. You got John, the apostle, next to Jesus, and then you got Judas over here. And then Peter's signaling to John. He's probably texting him under the table. Hey, t tell, him who, tell him to tell you who it is, right? And I'm pretty sure Peter would have took out his sword there and cut off Judas's ear. Uh, as well. That's probably why Jesus didn't tell him. But, um, you know, Jesus, I mean, Peter did, you know, some silly things. And we're like that too sometimes. We do uh, drastic things and we don't allow God to just, you know, just allow God to take care of it. The other day, uh, well, on four, not so long ago, two days ago, I think, uh, Valentine's, you know, I was getting my wife a, a gift. And uh, so I'm ready, you know, I got to go pick her up. I got everything planned out because it's kind of hard for me to surprise people. And uh, that's not one of my gifts. But, um, you know, I got the flowers ready, I got the gift card, and this and that, and so I put the stuff in the trunk so she doesn't see it, and I locked the door, I'm walking to the front door, and I locked the, I locked the keys in there too, and I'm stuck, and I'm trying to open the window, and there's kind of like a creek, I can stick my hand in there, and I'm, I'm pulling, and then, and you know, I'm parked back here, and, and this guy shows up from the Habitat for Humanity, right? And I'm wearing a beanie, I got a, you know, my hair was kind of messed up, and I'm Mexican, like, oh, this guy's going to think I'm robbing the, the van, the church van or something. And uh, I was like, I got to avoid the appearance of it. So I sort of waited out a little bit, and then he took off, and I'm back at it again. And eventually, I'm pulling, and it shatters, it breaks. You know, I made a mess of things when I could have just called, you know, someone, a professional to do it. That, that's what uh, Peter does here. He, ma he makes a mess of things because he just tries to do it his own way, try to protect the, the king of kings. Uh, the other Gospels tell us that, you know, Jesus attaches uh, the ear back on this, uh, this servant. It wasn't time for him to, to lose his ear just yet. It says the servant's name was Malchus. And you'll see why they name him later on. You, you'll sort of get a hint. Uh, verse 11, so Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? Then the detachment of troops and the captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. You see that? Now he just finally gave himself over to them. Why did Peter have a sword? I don't know. It's a good question. But he says, shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? Referring to, you know, the, what he w would have to endure, the suffering. Peter, Peter would have, have his time later on. I think in the later chapters we see that Jesus tells him, you know, uh, yeah, you, you're going you're gonna to share in a cup of suffering as well. If we know through history, Peter was crucified upside down, right? He shared he had his own cup of suffering there, but it wasn't time for him yet. Chuck Smith talks about this verse in reference to being bound. <clears throat> he says, I suspect that God had to restrain the angels at this point as they saw what was happening to Jesus. They didn't need to bind Jesus. He was bound by cords much stronger than the ropes they used. He was bound by his love for you. Yeah, he did it all uh, for us. Restrain himself. Humility. Verse 13, and they led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, 
who was high priest that year. Now it was Caiaphas who advised the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. And here he's just, John is making mention uh, that Caiaphas, in the earlier chapters, right after, uh, there, he was upset, you know, because Jesus uh, rose Lazarus from the dead. You know, they're like, you know, we got to kill this guy. They even wanted to put Lazarus back to death. They wanted to kill him again. And uh, Caiaphas unwittingly prophesied that it is fitting that one man should die for the people, but he didn't know that, yeah, one man would die for the people, Jesus Christ, for the sins of all men. And here John makes it a point to mention what Caiaphas had prophesied there. Uh, n fourth point here, Jesus denied. Now we're going to skip over some verses here just to focus on, on the denial of Peter. Okay, verses 19 and 24, and then we'll go back to them. In verse 15, though, it says, And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. And it's believed that that was John, John the Apostle. Before I forget, because I want to make sure I make this point, in the other Gospels, it says that he was just dressing like a sheet, right? And uh, he goes out, they try to grab him. And they, he takes off, they grab a sheet, the sheet comes off, and he's just, he books it, he's naked somewhere, you know, and... And eventually he goes back to, and, and finds Jesus. But that, this is a guy. This is a, a John here. That's probably why he didn't want to mention his name, the other disciple. He was embarrassed. It says, Now that the disciple was known to the high priest, he knew the high priest and went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. Verse 16, <clears throat> But Peter stood at the door outside. Then the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to her who kept the door, the servant girl here, and brought Peter in. Then the servant girl who kept the door said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the servants and officers who had made a fire of cold stood there, for it was cold and they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. So you see John, he goes in there. He's like, hey, let my friend Peter in. He sends the servant girl out. She goes to let him in to the courtyard there. They're having a bonfire, keeping themselves warm. And uh, the servant girl is the first one to ask him, aren't you, weren't you with Jesus? Weren't you one of those guys? Peter denies Jesus for the first time here. He's not remembering that what Jesus had told him, you're going to deny me three times just yet. He didn't hit him just yet. But do you see the change here? He cut somebody's ears, ear off for Jesus when Jesus was around. Now that Jesus is not around, he's denying. The, the tongue of a young girl is sharper than, than, than a sword for Peter here. Verse 25, Now Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. Therefore they said to him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? Second time he denies it. And he says, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of him whose ear Peter cut off, said, Did I not see you in the garden with them? Wouldn't that be kind of awkward? You know, you just cut, cut this guy's uh, relative's ear off, and now you're there, you know, Hey, give me some room in the fire. And, uh, and you know, he's already denied Jesus several times here. And then verse 27 says, Peter then denied again, and immediately a rooster crowed. Luke's account sort of gives us deeper insight. And he, Luke says, Immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept uh, bitterly. Okay? He didn't just allow tears to fall down his eyes. He was, he was crying. He was pouring. Why? Because he was convicted. Because Jesus is right. And that's what the Word does, you know? We tend to have our own ideas, our own thoughts, our own presuppositions, and all this and that. But you know, when the Word just speaks to you, if you're a born-again believer, and you speak, it's going to convict you. Okay? And there should be a reaction from the Word of God. And here it penetrated the heart of, of Peter. I think this denial, this conviction prompted him even more. I mean, you know, all glory goes to the power of the Holy Spirit and the day of Pentecost when he just goes out there and preaches boldly. He's the first one to do it. But I think he wanted to redeem himself as well for denying Jesus. Now let's go to verse 19. Let's go back a, a little bit. And we're going to look at Jesus uh, being despised by the high priest's uh, father-in-law here. It says in verse 19, The high priest then asked Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spoke openly to the world. I always taught in the synagogues and in the temple, where the Jews always meet. And in secret I have said nothing. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. Indeed, they know what I said. Verse 22, And when he had said these things, one of the officers who stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Do you answer the high priest like that? So what Jesus was doing here, 
there were no witnesses. That was an, um, an unlawful trial by night. And he's trying to tell him, look, ask the witnesses. Oh, yeah, you don't have witnesses here. You're not judging me rightly. Again, bring the law back to, to him, bringing the question back to him. And here we have this guy that seems to be the first man that ever strikes, uh, slaps the face of, of Jesus Christ. I hope he got saved because he's probably got a special place in, in, in hell. You know? But I've heard it said before, you know, that, that when we try to get to heaven on our own, it's like a, a slap to Jesus' face because he's already done it. When we say, well, I believe in Jesus, but then I want to add this. To that. I need to do as much as I can as well. well it's, it's like a slap. Jesus said it is finished. Obedience follows, um, you know, salvation. Let's continue here. Verse 23, Jesus answered him. Notice how it doesn't say Jesus turned the other cheek. If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if well, why do you strike me? He sort of, you know rebukes him. Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. So he starts with one guy, then he goes to the next guy. But see, John is not going to get into the, the situation with Herod or Caiaphas. He's going to focus on the conversation he has with a pilot, Pontius Pilate. John does this in verse 28. He says, Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium, and it was early morning, but they themselves did not go into the praetorium, lest they should be defiled but that they might eat the Passover. Now, here the Praetorium is this area in the temple there, the Gentile area. The Jews could not go in there, especially during the Passover, because they said, well, I'll make myself unclean, then I can't take the Passover. But isn't that hypocritical? They were already unclean for, for just then crucifying the Messiah here, for falsely accusing him. But, they, but that's what religion does. It neglects the fact of, of a true relationship with Jesus Christ, and it focuses on, on you know, other stuff, ways that you can make yourself holy before God. So they call uh, Pontius Pilate out from this place because they can't go in there. In verse 29 it says, Pilate then went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he, if he were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. Then Pilate said to them, You take him and judge him according to your law. Therefore the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spoke, signifying what dead death he would die. Then Pilate entered the praetorium again, called Jesus, and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Now, they had already told uh, Pilate that this guy, you know, he's trying to make himself an uh, uh, earthly king, a secular king. So Pilate couldn't judge him on religious laws. That, that wasn't his deal. He didn't care about that. But if he was trying to come up against the Roman Empire, being an earthly king, then that would have to do with taxes. So then he's like, Come on, step inside my office here. He probably was surrounded by Roman soldiers now. So let's continue here. He asked him if he's a king. Verse 34, Jesus answered him, Are you speaking for yourself about this, or did others tell you this concerning me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your nation and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? In verse 36, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world... My servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. And this sort of answers the question in verse 36. Uh, the answer to why he didn't allow uh, Peter uh, to just continue to chop more ears off. You know, because it wasn't time yet. This is his first coming. Second coming he is going to, to judge the world. It's not his kingdom yet. He's going to redeem it. So he tells him he's, he's not an earthly king here. Pilate, verse 37, Pilate therefore said to him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered, You say rightly that I am a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And Jesus basically, how close can you get? And how far can you be from, from salvation here? Jesus is face to face with Pilate, and Pilate is just like, What is truth? Kind of like what you hear today, you know, the, the culture of today, especially in college, you, you see this, this uh, thought of, uh, you know, just, um, you know, it, it, what's right for you is not necessarily right for me. It depends on the culture, it depends on this and that, the situation, situational ethics and this and that, right? Moral relativism is what, what it's called. And, and that's basically what, what Pontius is saying here. What is truth? Yet he was faced with the truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and, and he wasn't aware did Pilate get saved? 
I don't think so. Uh, from history, we know that he uh, committed suicide almost 10 years after this in AD, AD 40. Things got kind of uh, kind of rough with the, those above him, and uh, he committed suicide. But yes, you know, a lot of people are like that. You know, what is truth? A lot of philosophy out there. You know, what, what is abs there cannot be any absolutes, they say. There's a story about uh, J.P. Moreland. I don't know if it, if it was when he was younger or not, but he's uh, in this college dorm. He's witnessing to this guy, right? And he tells him, uh, you know, you got to say, Jesus, this and that, he died for you, da, da, da. And the guy throws out the moral relativism card. And he says, well, that might be right for you, but I believe this. This is right for me. You, there are no wrong, rights and wrongs, no absolutes. And J, uh, J.P. Morgan, he's sort of, uh, okay, he starts walking out of the room. Before he walks out, he, he grabs his stereo and he starts walking out. He's like, wait, 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 where are you going? And he's like, well, I'm taking this. You know, I need something to listen to worship while I do my devotions. And uh, he's like, well, you can't do that. So he's like, why not? Well, because it's wrong. Wait, why are you imposing? I believe it's right. It's not wrong for me to do it. Why are you imposing your, uh, you know, why are you imposing absolutes now on me? And then he sort of got the hint, you know, that everybody is sort of uh, hypocritical in that area. There are absolutes, and God is going to judge based on his righteous standard one day if we do not go through Jesus Christ. So let's continue here. Pilate did not understand that Jesus, the truth, and life was right in front of his face. It go, and it says, and when he had said the, this, he went out again to the Jews and said to them, I find no fault in him at all. Verse 39, but you have a custom that I should release someone to you at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Then they all cried again, saying, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. And that's kind of sad. You got this murderer here, and they release, release him instead of Jesus Christ. And it, it's sort of a, a, what is it, a foreshadowing of what's going to happen in the future. Because the Jews do accept the Antichrist, will accept the Antichrist in the future. They've already denied the true Messiah. The interesting thing falls right here on Barabbas. What does that name mean? Barabbas means the son of the father. Look it up if you don't believe me. It means the son of the father. But Jesus is the true son of God. He is the son of the father. And he is rejected by the Jews. The Jews uh, accept this, uh, you know, Barabbas, this false son of the father. It's sort of a typology to what is going to happen in the future. That finishes, finishes up the chapter, but I do have two points. My first point is based off of that verse, verse 1, right? Being under, under pressure. And it's a big thing with us because, you know, I know I want a stress-free life, a stress-free environment. We don't want to be under stress. We don't, but sometimes God just wants to stretch us. He wants to make us flexible so he can use us. So that's my first point. Prepare for pressure. Acts 14 says, we must through many tribulations enter the kingdom of God. See, we're going to be hard-pressed from every side. From every side. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 4, We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. Why are we pressured? Why are we molded through, you know, this, this fire of trials and problems, uh, persecutions? Because Jesus is supposed to be revealed in us. It's like they say, you know, Christians are like tea bags. You know, you don't know what kind of flavor they are until you put them in hot water, right? And if you are a Christian, you're going to reveal uh, that, you know, flavor of Jesus Christ. In verse 11 here, 2 Corinthians, For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested, again, may be manifested in our mortal flesh, so then death is working in us, but life in you. Verse 16, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. You might be saying, Lord, why am I going through this problem? Okay, why am I struggling with this? Right? A lot of times we do dumb things and we sort of, we, we, uh, we sow to the wind, we'll reap the whirlwind. A lot of times it's our fault. But there are those times when the Lord is doing something in our lives. And the reason is because He wants to work in us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And it's for a moment. It's for a time. Verse 18, while we do not know, uh, look at the things which are seen, but at things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So we know there are trials, and they are for a moment, they are for a time. 
right? We went to pray for uh, JP the other day because, you know, he's got, you know, keep him in prayer because he had a kidney uh, uh, stones and some gallstones, and we need to keep him in prayer for that. But we went to pray for him. I took Jack because, you know, Jack's been through that. He can relate to him. I can't relate to him yet, right? But he can come for him in a better way. I hope I can never relate to you, JP. <laughs> but, uh, you know, present times. Anyways, the, Jack says... Uh, Jack says, this will pass. This will pass, soon pass. And I'm like, yeah, it's going to pass literally. The stones are, are going to pass. And, you know, some good humor to, you know, cheer him up. But it's for a time, right? Trials for a time. We got to be heavenly minded. And I have three self points for this about prayer. Remember I was telling you about the other gospels, how they talk about uh, uh, what happened in the garden? We got to pray attentively. Matthew tells us, watch and pray lest you enter temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. I like how the Amplified puts it. All of you must keep awake, give strict attention, be cautious and active, and watch and pray that you may not come into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So he says, watch and pray. When do we, are we even praying at all? We need to pray, uh, you know, aware. Are we aware of what we're praying? And what I mean by that is... Um, Look at the surroundings. Lord, why is this happening in my life? This, this uh, Greek word for watch is used in Matthew 24 as well when it's talking about the end times, you know, watch the seasons, watch what's going on, you know, the, the birth pains and all that. So I can apply here and say, you know, as you're praying, watch. Not only, don't just keep awake, but be aware. Lord, what are you doing in my life? Where am I going through this? And allow that to, to factor into your prayers. Number two, pray seriously. Luke 22 tells us, being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And then he goes on to say how he was sweating blood and all that. But he prayed more earnestly. During those tough times, pray more earnestly. And third point here, pray his will. His will. He did that on the disciples' prayer. Remember that? Matthew chapter 6. Here he says, He went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Right? And that the, the actual, I think the actual, the worst part of it was when God turned his, the Father turned his face from the Son because of all the sin he took upon, uh, upon himself. Right? God is so holy he cannot be before sin. But Jesus took that punishment for us. I think that was a great, that hurt more than the nails. That hurt more than that crown of thorns, than the, you know, the agony, all this and that. That hurt more than all this other stuff. The Father turned his face from the Son. Think of it. He took upon the first sin. He took upon the, the first sin of Adam and Eve. He took upon every other sin since then up to, you know, his blood is, is good for you and me today. It atones for, for us. All, any murders, r rapists, and all this stuff, all that he took upon the cross for us. That was, that was no, that's no joke. Let's continue here. Second point, and this point is based off of the, the actions of Peter. Don't be a long distance disciple. You see that? See, Peter, he was brave when Jesus was there, but when he was gone, when he was taken, he was afraid of a little girl, right? Her tongue was sharper than, than the sword that he might have got for uh, accepting Jesus. He was a long-distance disciple. He watched from afar off, but he was able to be afar off just enough so Jesus can make eye, eye contact with him and he could be aware of it. Don't be a long-distance disciple. And I think it comes down to fear. Do you have a godly fear or do you have a man fear? Do you fear man or do you fear God? And what I mean by that is uh, when, you, when you tell others about Jesus, do you allow what they might say, the hypotheticals? You know, what if they deny Jesus? What if they do this and that? What if they accept Jesus? You know, how are we going to know if we, we don't tell them? So when we put the, the, the fear of man here and we have the fear of God here, we're sort of committing some form of idolatry. We're putting man before God. We're putting the creature before uh, the Creator. Look at what Acts 9 says about the, the fear of the Lord and the churches. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace. That's one thing. We're edified and walking in the fear of the Lord. And what happens when you walk in the fear of the Lord? And in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. We can't do it without the Holy Spirit, obviously. But I see three things surrounding the fear of the Lord. I see peace, I see edification, I see growth. And fear in the Lord is sort of like, lo like uh, love is to action. Love, you've heard it said, it's not a feeling, it's, it's an action. The same way, the fear of the Lord, I've, I believe it's obeying God. 
obeying, not because of trembling fear, but of reverence, awe, and worship. Now we're, we're going to continue here in the fear of the, of the believer. We saw the fear of the church, of the Lord. Now look at Psalm 112. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. The New Living says, delight in obeying his commands. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. His heart is steady. He will not be afraid until he looks in triumph on his adversaries. And the four things I got from this is they are blessed. That tells us in first verse uh, 1 there. They are blessed. They obey his commands. They aren't shook up over bad news. Just the other day, well, maybe a couple weeks ago, but, you know, uh, I already knew my, our car was going to break down. It's not news to me. And, uh, you know, sometimes we get all distraught. And the car finally broke down, you know, the motor's out. Okay, oh well, it's too bad. Maybe a couple years back, it would be all distressed, you know. Distressed over bad news, as it says here, you know, afraid of bad news. But that just told me, yeah, I'm going to get a new car. You know, the Lord, the Lord is going to give it to me. So sometimes we allow bad news to get over us, to, to just take, get the most out of us. When we need to just pause, calm, and try to find out again, watch and pray. See what God is trying to do in our lives. Right? Don't allow bad news to shake you up. You've got to be immovable. And number four here, it says, the fear of man is not, uh, I see that the fear of man is not in them. Right? Because it says here, he looks in triumph on his adversaries. When we, fear that, when we have a healthy fear of the Lord, we'll be able to do the rest of the things because we're not afraid of what man can do to us. Right? And I want to finish with this last, uh, last uh, verses here. And this is Peter in, this, in 1 Peter 2. This is Peter uh, talking. You can go there, by the way. If I'm going to cover a little, quite a bit here. 1 Peter 2, uh, verse 19. Peter, the same guy that denied Jesus, the same guy that what, he weeped bitter, bitterly. Later on, years later, he writes this epistle, and he starts talking. I think he got the point. He understood. It says in 1 Peter 2, 19, If because of conscience for God... In other words, if because you're a Christian, because you believe in Jesus Christ, because of you fear the Lord, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. For what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving an, us an example. And chapter 18 is the example. Okay? It can also be titled that. You know, the example that Christ left for us. That you should follow his steps. And that's a hard part. Because, wait, wait, oh, I know it's an example, but then it says, I got to follow his steps. That's, got, that's a little bit harder. But see, if we don't fear man, you know, we're going to step out in faith. We're going to do what the Lord has called us to do. And we are going to see some persecution, some affliction. But that's okay, because for Jesus Christ. Verse 22, he who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, did not revile in return, when he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously. So you see that, how Jesus was the great example? And we saw that in, in chapter 18, what he suffered, internal pressure uh, and external pressure, right? But all that, when we do suffer that stuff, it's a, an opportunity for us to reveal Christ. So if you guys that work in secular jobs or around unbelievers, whether they're family or co-workers, you're going to get revived. They're going to talk about you if you're acting like a Christian. That is. If you're not, well, you know, they're going to welcome you. It's, I don't think there's such a thing as a popular Christian, right? Or you're not going to remain popular for a long time if you're obeying Jesus Christ, right? So be comforted in these things. If you're having problems, they're only for a time. And uh, Jesus already endured. You're not sweating blood, right? He's, our, he's already sweating blood. You're not going to burn out. Let's pray. Lord, uh, we thank you, Father, because uh, you're awesome. Because... Uh, you are the example of examples. and uh, Lord, the words of the prophet Haggai come to mind. And uh, your prophet uh, told the people, Is it right for you to dwell in your paneled houses while the, the temple li lies in ruins? Lord, we want to get our priorities straight. We want to uh, do all we can for you before you're coming. And we know you're coming as soon, Lord. Father, use us. Help us. Help us not to be fearful of men. Help, help us to share our faith uh, without fear. We thank you, Lord. And we know that comes by putting you first, by fearing you first, Father. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand together.